Take Fountain. Um, I'm here with Tom Mount. I'm Bill Getty. I'm introducing us because this may be our first show. I mean, who knows? Could be. If it mm-hmm. isn't, if you've seen other shows before this, we screwed up somehow and we decided this should be a later show. Um, we are here because we uh, met up uh, through our friend uh, Jen Joseph. Uh, we met up about, I don't know, almost a year ago. Yeah. And, and we started talking and we just thought we were hysterical. So, so, so we, we had so many stories, and it was so interesting, I thought, to hear what he had to say, and I guess he thought I was interesting, too. And so now we're here to see if you think the same. Um, we both worked in, uh, uh, Tom, in motion pictures and, and, and me in television. We have seen almost everything, heard almost everything. We have stories about almost every one. And we thought, well, that might be a good podcast. We call it Take Fountain, which is based on the famous uh, Betty Davis uh, remark, which is how does a a young actress make it in Hollywood? She says, Take Fountain, and which was basically the way of saying, screw you, Johnny, I'm not giving any information to some young Hollywood actress. I'm just going to tell her how to get to Hollywood faster because Sunset's always clogged, Um, which I thought, that's that's such a cool phrase, Take Fountain, so that's what we adopted for the show. Anyway, so Tom and I would meet every week, and we'd have a coffee. And one of the first things he started talking about was his relationship with Richard Pryor, which I had no idea. I didn't know any of these stories. I thought Richard Pryor was the greatest, but I had no idea how it began, his movie career, and so on. I thought, let's start with that, because it's one of the, in my right, it's one of the first things yeah. we talked about. It is. Um, how do, and we're going to do this for a couple of days, and Jenny Pryor, his, his widow, who was his like fourth and seventh wife or something. She was there when he died. She was there early on. She's going to join us in the next um, installment of this podcast. But I want to start at the beginning. When did you first hear the name Richard Pryor? So um, I went to Universal and I kind of quickly moved up through the ranks, I think mostly because they were too confused or um, uh, abundantly distracted to see that I was moving up to the ranks. And you were very young. I mean, this is, you're, you have that sort of like uh, boy wonder thing attached to you every time you read about you. So you're yeah. how old when you're, you're almost president of, well, I guess you're president of, of Universal almost at what, 27 or something? 26. 26. 20, 20, <laughs> yeah, which 20, is really hard to imagine, actually. Well, yeah, I tried doing it. Yeah, it was really imagine. hard, totally yeah. hard to imagine. Yeah. So in any event, um, I decided that the studio uh, needed an identification in Hollywood. Uh, Warner Brothers owned action pictures. Paramount right. was the sophisticated headquarters. Anything that was yeah. unique or sophisticated or and culturally edgy in that way was a Paramount picture. Sure. Fox owned romance. Everybody had a different category. Nobody owned comedy. Ah. So I set out to conquer comedy. And so I had a casting director who was working with me named Michael Chinich. And he came in my office one day and he said, so this is, I just saw this great show in the valley, he's doing 20 minutes, he's opening for some saxophone player over there on Van Nuys, and you've got to go see him. You've got to go see him. So I was like, Richard Pryor, and I said, but isn't, I mean, Richard Pryor, honestly, my experience of Richard Pryor at that point was that he was boring. Yeah. I mean, he was doing like straight stuff in a tie and a suit with Johnny Carson. Where yeah, you see all that stuff early on where he's, he's dressed l- like he's going to, to be an accountant someplace. Yeah, that's yeah. right. He's going to his bar mitzvah and yeah, it's exactly. like ridiculous. Yeah. And, and um, you can tell that he's fundamentally uncomfortable in his skin. Right. So I was excited about Lily Tomlin. I was excited about a lot of people, Robin Williams, people that I was bringing to the studio because they had authenticity. Right. While I wasn't looking... Richard went through a whole life change. A lot of things happened to him, which I won't enumerate, except to say I end up in a really grade C jazz club in the valley where some saxophone dude is playing something that I vaguely remember from Top 40 Radio. Yeah. And Richard does his 20-minute opening. 20-minute opening was the best piece of comedy I had seen, period. Not in recently. So this is a little room in the valley. Someplace. It's a little room in the valley. How many people are at, th- at this oh, thing? Oh, maybe it would seat at the max maybe 100 people. And what's his act? Give me anything that he's talking about. Uh, well, he opened the, I'll tell you exactly because I remember it vividly. Okay. He walked up, he looked at the audience, he picked up a microphone, he looked at everybody again, didn't say much, and then he said, motherfucker, motherfucker, motherfucker. 
And I thought, well, okay, we're <laughs> let's, here. Let's get that out of the let's way. Let's get that out of the way. Let's just, <laughs> I thought that was spectacularly <laughs> smart, given where comedy was yeah, at that exactly. time and what everybody yeah. else was That'll doing. That'll loosen up the crowd right there. Yeah. Wake them up. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yes, and you talk about woke. i got to say, Richard was woke before woke was yeah. even woke. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in any event, went backstage. Uh, the guy was clearly high. He yeah. was doing heroin, which I was unfortunate enough to kind of interrupt a little bit of that. And Wait, so he walk in and he's shooting up? Well, and he just finished. Okay. But, you know, we have a spoon and a yeah. thing and a... St- anyway. Right. So, huh. We talk. I hang around and we talk. Um, he's got all kinds of hanger-ons already. Remember, he had had a career that went up and it had already come down. And he'd been you know, excommunicated from Las Vegas, and he'd been... Is this, is this when he got kicked out of Vegas? Is that what... This is after that. After think, that. Yeah. But yeah. this is very early. I mean, most people wouldn't have heard of Richard Pryor at this point. Well, I, he'd been on Johnny Carson a couple of times. Yeah, a couple of times, And he'd times, been right. on Merv Griffin. Yeah, yeah. And I remember the Merv Griffin. Yeah, yeah any, any comedian who goes on Merv Griffin and sees that as a reasonable thing to do is not somebody I wanted to hire. <laughs> I mean, Merv Griffin, very nice Can, man, but... Yeah. Boy, can't be yourself on Merv Griffin. You can't do your act. Man, oh yeah. man. So, yeah. in any event, um, I said to Richard that I would give him a certain amount of money and sign him to a three-year contract, and we'd find a way to do a bunch of movies together. Wait, right then and there, he's sitting there high. Yeah. And you say, I want to sign a three-picture deal with you. Yeah. And I'm not expecting him to do anything except right. refer me to a lawyer, and he said he didn't have a lawyer. So I called Skip Brittenham, who's a friend of mine, who's a lawyer, yeah. a big guy, and in Hollywood and also handle talent and stuff and skip and I said look I, you, this has to be arm's length third party stuff skip was not my didn't work with me or for me yeah. or had no no conflict of interest no conflict right and so they we hammered out a, a what was actually a pretty good deal for Richard uh, for those first three years that that got extended and ultimately became a uh, 11 year deal ran for 11 years with constant revisions Richard made a lot of money. We made a lot of. We made nine pictures with Richard during that period. Okay, so let's go. Let's take this piece by piece. You, the first movie, you say, I've got it. What? How's that happening? I've got a script for you. It's perfect for you. It's called what? It's a little more complicated than that. Okay. <laughs> I've been developing something that I called, and remember, I'm not running the studio yet. I'm, okay. I'm on the way to running. But the you're, studio. You, you've got enough power to offer him a three-picture. Oh deal. yeah, yeah, I can do that. Okay. But, but again, I'm, you know, I can't go say. Yes, to this twenty. You can't green light a movie. picture at this stage. I, no, 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 absolutely not. And so what happens? So, huh? So we were developing. There's a guy who was a publicist and music guy named mm-hmm. Gary Stromberg. Gary Stromberg had a kind of genius idea of doing a play in Washington D.C. at the Arena Stage, which he already had some relationship with, set entirely in a car wash. So I said, "This is not a play. This is a movie." Mm-hmm. Let me get this material in the house here, and we will fix it. I got Joel Schumacher, who had just written Sparkle, Mm -hmm. and done a great job. And Joel, of course, understood um, edgy cultural humor really well. And Joel wrote the. But Joel is Joel is white. Joel is gay. Yes. And 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 this is a and and this is sort of I find interesting. How many black movies would be considered a black movie? Car wash. Is what you're talking about, yeah, right? Yeah, I'm talking about Car Wash, yes. This is considered a black movie. How many black movies did Universal do in those days? None. Um, I was the first. St- I started that. I, as fact, uh, Mr. Washerman called me into his office. He was the chairman of the company and a very intimidating character, sure, to put yeah. it mildly. I Famous. still call him Mr. Washerman because I'm afraid if I call him Lou, his ghost will come down right. and smite me. So, right. so I... Uh, who said, Mr. Washerman said, <laughs> we're going to win the NAACP Image Award. Right. And we're going to make a black motion picture. And the Image Awards were in the fall. I, I don't know what time they, when they are yeah. now, but they yeah. may have moved around. But they sure. were in the fall in those days. And I had 10 months, and I had no picture. So the first picture was not car wash. The first picture was called the Bingo Long Traveling All-Stars and Motor Kings, and you have never heard of it. I have heard of it, but I've never seen it. It's a great picture. Is it? If you are black, it's a wonderful picture. It's a period it's, thing, right? It's a period piece about the Negro National Leagues. Okay. And it's 
stars uh, Billy D. Williams, yes. James Earl Jones, and Richard Pryor. Well, what a, what a cast. All, all in roles yeah. of equal size. Right. And it unwraps the kind of pre-Major League, pre-Jackie Robinson history of baseball. And so it's a comedy, and it's outrageous, and we shot it in Macon, Georgia. Remind me not to do that again. Yeah, uh, that, that, was, that was tough, huh? Mm-hmm. Well, Macon, Georgia had a sheriff who took offense that we had actual black citizens, movie actors, staying in their best local hotel. Ah. So we were ordered to move out, and no other hotel would take us. So I made a deal with a local college. Well, what year is this? I mean, this oh, is a, this, this is an is, ancient history. This no, is no, no, no. Late seventies or something? Yeah, this is seventy in the middle of seventies. Okay, mid seventies. Yeah, yeah, like that. And so uh, we get, made a deal with a local college. We took over a couple of dormitories. It was summer; they weren't using right. it, and we housed everybody there. It's just so, and we put I hired a couple of guards to make sure that. The clan or some other thing, you know, yeah. and this is the home of Otis Redding, sure. where uh, black people still in those days were not uh, welcomed. Mm -hmm. uh, Rob Cohen was the producer. He worked for Barry Gordy. Barry Gordy was the guy who got the credit as the producer. Right. He stayed in the office and helped us put some music together. That was great. Well, that was so, a big. It was a big music album. I remember Car Wash. It was yeah. a fun movie. Yes. And it's a big. Uh, well, bing, well, bingo, but, but, yeah. but bingo. Yeah, Bingo Long first. Bingo so, Long first. So we do that. And you're talking about the music for Bingo Long or for Car Wash? I'm, I'm talking about both. Okay, fine. Because I have Barry Gordy in my life now. But moving, okay, fine. Out, moving away. Moving on. <laughs> so uh, everybody at the studio thinks Bingo Long is a total write-off. Right. I mean, this is regarded as lose kind of sops at the NAACP and yeah. leave us alone and we'll be fine and... All that. None Just of a that prestige true. sort of thing. It's a chance to get an award, but it's not going to make any money. Yeah, and, and the picture actually in rentals, and rentals, let me say, you know, you read all this stuff in newspapers about how motion pictures uh, become profitable. Everything's uh, misinformation. Yeah. So the gross of the picture doesn't count. The net of the picture doesn't count because those two numbers, A, get gerrymandered tremendously by studios. Yeah. You no can't trust anybody. those numbers. Can't trust those numbers. But there's something called rentals. And rentals is, in effect, adjusted gross. That is to say, all the expenses off the top for real. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, what goes to the studio? Which is all the only question the studio is asking. Right. You know, some actors get some pieces and some director gets a little piece and this and that. But the real question is, what does the studio get to keep? Those are rentals. Uh -huh. So we kept $18 million on that picture. That's real money back That's in the real 70s. real money in yeah. the mid-70s on a little picture nobody's ever heard of that yeah. only black people went to. So, so uh, before this time, whenever, uh, whenever something would come out like Foxy Brown or uh, Cleopatra Jones, or what, you know, all those, yeah. those, were, those were not done by major studios. In general, they weren't. Some, a few of them were. but few you of know, them were, the, but for the, the most part... Across the 125th Street, the Mac, all this kind of yeah, stuff. This right. was basically uh, called black exploitation pictures because yes. not only were they exploitation pictures, but they exploited the downside, the dark side of black culture. Right. And so, what I set out to do with these pictures that we were doing, since I had a mandate, and you may have noticed that I'm white, yes, so I had I, a I mandate. Picked up on that early. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so I had a mandate to make this group of black pictures, which was insane. And so. A lot of discoveries in that process, by the way. I discovered that there were only two viable black directors in America at that time, two. And, hello, maybe three viable black screenwriters in the entire business. Right. And most of those people were in New York, and most of them were working in television. And a few of them were working in theater. And so, bingo long, make some money. Basically, Mr. Wasserman says to me in a two-second conversation in an elevator, do that again. Do it again. So, car wash. So I go to Richard, here's the next one, car wash. Then I realize, which I hadn't realized in the first one, uh, Richard has a hard time reading. Mm -hmm. So I took the car wash script out to his house in the valley, in the middle of an orange grove, and uh, read it to him. So you read the entire script of Car Wash to him. Sure. And at the end, what did he say? He said, I'll do it. Okay, great. 
and uh, you know he has a character. And, and it's, he's not the big star in the movie. He's yeah. just he has a piece. It's an ensemble film. You know, I hate to keep coming back to this, but I'm going to. Yeah. Are drugs always part of the equation I with think him? That's. I mean, when you're with him, yeah. is he high a lot of the time? Yeah, maybe a, a reasonable amount of the time he's high. If we're going to dinner, we we started having dinner together at Musso and Frank's, an old joint in Hollywood on Hollywood Boulevard, and and we went there every two weeks, all the time. Yeah. And most of the time, he did not seem to be high to me. Okay. When he'd go to dinner, we'd talk about stuff and figure out life and figure out what we're doing career-wise, and also more importantly than that. Just gave him a place to, uh, in other words, he would watch a, a white waiter balancing a huge tray of steaks going down the row, picking up glasses with his other hand and doing kind of uh, astonishing uh, gymnastics on behalf of the clients. And he'd look over at me and go, Tom, white people are funny. <laughs> And it's true. White people are funny. If yeah. you start looking at them through the other filter. Well, well, a large part of his act was imitating white people. Yeah, oh, yeah. Which Absolutely. is some, one of, some of the funniest stuff in his act is when imitating Very white funny. people. Very funny. Yeah. Very funny. Yeah. So, in any event, we kept making movies, and we made a bunch of them. So, so you're, you're meeting at it, 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 Musso, uh, Musso, Frank, Musso and Franks, and you're, and, and you're getting closer and closer to him. What is your relationship is, exactly? What is, what, what, what is it that you, what does he see in you and what do you see in him? Well, uh, if you're going out every week, there's yeah, something. Every couple of weeks, I would say, I mean, first of all, we just liked each other. Yeah. I mean, he made me laugh, not in the way that he would be on stage telling jokes. He made me laugh because his, his vision, his take on the culture around us was so acute. I mean, Rich was smart as hell. You know, and yeah. kind of uneducated, and it never got in his way. Yeah. His smartness superseded anything that had to do with intellect. It was about authenticity. Right. Who are, who are people to each other? So, what, There's a story about, I, I feel like this is true anyway, about Lily Tomlin at Musso Frank's. And I, before we leave that, by the way, what did you order at Musso? Do you, was it martini? No, you don't drink. I don't drink. What, is, right. what, did, what did he order? No, I don't know yeah. why I'm curious. Yeah, what yeah. would you order? Well, yeah, why, what he the Welsh order, rare bit and a martini. No, 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 uh, no. Yeah. Remember that <laughs> Musso Franks is the last totally old school menu left on the West Coast. Exactly right. So this is like the equivalent of going to Sardi's 50 years ago. Right. And so there's things like abalone yeah, sure. on the menu. Yes, exactly. You know, try finding that somewhere. Chops. Chops. Oh, yeah, a lot of chops. <laughs> and something for dessert called Diplomat Pudding, oh. which is kind of tapioca with some strawberries Fantastic. and some who knows what. I love hell. it. Anyway, <laughs> so we had a smorgasbord of a menu, and it was fun. He That's usually right. had a steak. I usually had a steak, but nevertheless. So Lily Tomlin, this true? Yeah. So one day, so we, every, Lily and Richard were good friends. Uh, Lily had been really supportive of Richard early on. When Lily had television opportunities, she would bring Richard into the show you know, and defended him in a way that nobody else did. So sure. she knew we were having this regular dinner, and one night there was a cop walking back and forth on Hollywood Boulevard in front of Musso's. There was a front door. We sat in a booth very near the front door. Neither of us paid any attention to that. And finally, after a while, we ordered food and started to talk, and the cop came kind of blustering into the place and pulled a baton out and pointed it at Richard and said something to the effect of you. And Richard's like, whoa, what the hell is this? And then we both look at the cop and we look at each other and we realize it's Lily Tomlin. Dressed who, as a cop. Dressed as a cop who has decided to just, so I don't she know. Can pull a gag or pull a arrest gag him and somehow. Something. And, yeah. <laughs> and so in any event, Lily Tomlin, by the way, has been the most devoted and yeah, she, even, even when he got in trouble, because he got into trouble with the gay community back then, yes. what he did, I can't remember what it was, some one of these like big nights of stars or something like that, yeah. and it would benefits, Hollywood Bowl, Hollywood yeah. Bowl thing, yeah. and he said some things, and she was the first person out there saying, hey, yeah. this guy's cool. So um, I think if, when you say he said some things, I think what you're really looking for there, Bill, is uh, kiss my rich black ass. Yeah, that's what he said? Mm-hmm. Yeah. As he left the stage. It's funny. That seems pretty tame now, doesn't it? It seems like... <laughs> it seems like almost quaint. <laughs> it, it seems like it's too tame for Joe Rogan. So yeah, what can I does, say? It does, doesn't it? Um, there, this, 
there was a story, and I don't know if you want to tell it, but I, I, you told it to me, so I'm going to try to force you into it. All right, give it a shot. It's about you going to his house to get him to do, I feel like, voiceover work or something like oh, that. Oh, God. Well, yeah. So, so, what, so what picture is this we're talking about here? This picture we're talking about was called Which Way Is Up? And Which Way Is Up, by this time, Richard had some momentum. We were making pictures. The pictures made money. Car Wash made a lot of money. Yeah. And the album, which was done by Norman Whitfield, who had just left his uh, slave owner contract with Barry Gordy, and he, uh, he um, did a beautiful job. He put, created all the music, put it all together, put it on a tape, created a band out of some girls in a church choir in Pasadena called Rose Royce, and they, that album became a platinum album, and we made more money on the album than we did on the picture, but the picture was successful. That's great. So it was the whole thing worked out well at Car Wash. Yeah. Also, it had, had a bunch of hits on it, didn't it? It did. It had a bunch of hits. Yeah. So in any event, now we get to Which Way Is Up, and I'm trying to do several things. Remember, as these years go by, I'm for reasons that are entirely unclear and uh, mysterious even to me today, I keep being pushed up. At Universal, they would say, oh, you got a new title. That doesn't mean you get a raise. Oh, okay. Say, Great. Yeah, so sure. you get a new title, get a new title, yeah. get a new title. So I've you're, been there. Yeah. So you go, yeah, I'm sure you have. It's the kind of way of these systems. And, mm -hmm. and so you start out as somebody's assistant, and then you're mm -hmm. some kind of a production development guy, and then you're some kind of production executive, and then you're some kind of VP, and then you're some kind of head of production, whatever that means. And basically, you're all doing the same work. You're just doing more of it. Okay. And so... So at this stage, you're not president of Universal. Not yet. Okay. And, but I am uh, what they call head of production. Head of production. Which, which okay, is, fine. Which is, I don't know, government in waiting, right? okay. whatever that is. Okay. In any event... You're like a vice president. You're just, you, you, know, you, you think that your, your next move will probably be president. Yeah, well, what you're vice, for. vice president was less important in that structure, in the studio, okay. studio structure, than head of production. I'm sorry, I even asked. Yeah, no, now, I, it's more complicated than I want to know. Yeah. Okay, so, so you've got to get him going. to do some so voiceover. So we're doing, we shot Which Way Is Up, which is a terrific movie, and, and Richard was great in it, and he played multiple characters, which he'd always wanted to do. Sure. And, so all of that. And so uh, and the memorable scene in which he is the preacher and he informs the congregation that he needs to talk to them seriously about something. He wants to put on his platinum healing glove, mm -hmm. which he does and mm -hmm. raises it up. And then he says, I'm going to lay my glove on you. And a woman jumps up in the back of the audience and says, he never laid anything on me but his Johnson. <laughs> and then five other girls jump up and said, he did you, he did me too. And then, yeah, rah, 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 yeah, and right. then it's I know a, that okay, scene, yeah. yes. Yes, and so <laughs> that's the kind of scene that you want desperately to use in a trailer and nobody <laughs> and you will let you. Yeah, right? nobody will let you use so that. So yeah. in any event, um, the picture's booked. In other words, um, if you think about landing at a major airport, you know that people land in patterns mm -hmm. and their runway uh, regulations and you have to get your plane in the right pattern a certain number of yeah. minutes behind the plane in front of you and yeah. you have to land when you're told or to land. Otherwise you lose the window. Yeah, you lose the window and you cause all kinds of trouble for other people. Right. So it's, so the picture had been booked. Richard need to do it, needed to do voice replacement, which is different than dubbing over things like that. Voice replacement is this. There's scenes in which Richard either flubbed the line or we need to add something over the shoulder where mm -hmm. he needs to seem to be talking, but he isn't to make the story work. Right. And there was a good bit of it in this picture. Right. So it's tedious work tedious in a studio. Work at, in a studio, at the studio, right. and it's a thing. So he didn't show up, and then he didn't show up, and then he didn't show up. And so I go, what the hell is this? It's like three times, three weeks go by. Now the distribution guys are breathing down my neck. Is that picture going to be ready? Mm. Do we have to drop that from the schedule? What are we doing here? So I finally go to see Richard. I go out to the house. <sighs> Richard, come on. We've got to go do this voice replacement stuff. It's important. It's actually got a release date. You know, it's going to come out. A lot of people are counting on this. You need to step up and do this. He is in the middle of doing free base. He's freebasing when you free come in. when I come in. Is this the house in Van, Van Nuys, the yes. famous house in Van Nuys, where it becomes a big story later on with this, I yeah. assume? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So in any event, um, 
I didn't think I could get him to do it. And so I said to him, look, I'm, I've got a couple of tapes that I'm going to send you of the people that are going to do replace your voice. So I've hired some actors who sort of sound like you. Mm. And we're just going to use them mm. because I can't get you to. That's not good. He, that got to him. Yeah. He said, okay, okay, I'll come in. I'll come in tomorrow on one condition. Said, okay. He said, so you have to have a hit on this. I have to have a hit. This is, this is free basing. This is, you know, I, I'm a bit of a nerd on all this stuff, no, so right. I don't really know what you mean. You mean you, he wanted you to free base with him? Yes. He wanted me to hit the One big pipe hit off the pipe. pipe. And, I, and he would show up the next morning. So I okay. said, okay, there's going to be a driver here. And if I have to, an armed guard with the driver, they're going to pick you up at, you know, 9 yeah. o'clock tomorrow morning, blah, yeah. blah, blah. And I thought, how bad can this be? Bill, kind of like you, I'm the most, in it. I, somehow I survived the yeah. 60s and basically didn't do drugs. Yeah. I made a deal with myself when I was in college, undergraduate school, that I would try every drug around twice, and I'd just put that to bed. Right. So I had some idea of what was going on because everybody around sure. me was doing, you know, marijuana and... So you know what Coke, coke is, but you've never been a regular user of any right. of this stuff. So anyway, I right. did all that. It's done up. Okay. So... <laughs> certainly not free basic. It certainly, well, just I, just not my deal. I, yeah. you know, I was always sort of the designated driver in life. Yeah. God help everybody. Yeah. In any event, um, I got in the car and I left. On the way to the studio, I realized that something wasn't quite. So right. you've you've taken a big hit off this thing. I've taken a big hit off this thing. I go downstairs. I get in the car. Richards agreed to show up. The car. I you don't feel anything. You go, no, whatever I, you do, I'm and you go like, attention. and you I'm, say, okay, there it is. That's the deal. He says, fine, and you go get in your car. I'm driving my Porsche back. This to sounds the studio. terrible. And this sounds yeah. like a terrible idea. Yeah, this whole I'm thing on the Ventura Freeway, and it's the middle of the day, and there are cars everywhere, and it's yes. yeah. And so I get on the phone to my uh, long-suffering assistant, Seal, who is now 100 years old and still calls me periodically to remind me to do things. That's great. And um, I say, look, uh, I'm a little uh, screwed up here, and I'm on the way in, and I think I'll make it, but I cancel everything, and just, I just want to go sleep. Mm -hmm. So I get the car in the garage without hitting anything, which is a miracle, and... I go in my office, shut the door, and I'm out for three or four hours. And when I come to, I'm beginning to see the world as I knew it, at yeah. least a little bit. Yeah. In any event, the good news is Richard showed up. Okay. And did so it his, worked. Yeah, it worked. And that and that was that was the only time in our more than a decade together, uh, like 15 years or something together, that the only time that there was any drug crossover as between the two of us and and there were long periods when Richard would be straight right you know he would say oh I'm not doing this again I'm thing you know it's funny I, I read this whole uh, when you say when he was straight I read this whole interview that you did with him an interview everybody can see this an interview right remember this remember this this giant thing that used to you know, used to get off the stand this is what is this in early 80s or something like something. that? something yeah and uh and he appears to be straight in this. I don't know. I'm just guessing. He yeah. seems like, you know. I don't think he was stoned for that. Yeah. No. You said, uh, th there's, when I have this picture in my head of Richard, which is the guy who can't get out of his own way. This is sort of how I, I see him, which is that this incredible talent, but he can't, he keeps messing it up to some degree. Mm -hmm. You have a quote, and, I, and I'm going to find it right here. It was in a documentary I saw. It says, uh, when Richard betrayed himself, which he did quite often, he thought the betrayal belonged to everyone else. What does that mean exactly? That means that Richard, um, advertently or inadvertently, Richard surrounded himself with a lot of uh, barnacles, leeches, people who attached themselves to the hull of his ship for money, fame, power, whatever, mostly money. When things went wrong, which they did frequently, Mostly it was Richard's fault, but he had a lot of people that were um, somewhat by degrees disreputable and they were not sincere friends, and it was easy to blame them for whatever went wrong, right. and so he blamed them. And one of the problems with Richard, from my point of view, you surround yourself with a bunch of lowlifes, 
you know, the odds that you get in trouble, the odds that you have to bail them out of trouble, the odds that they get you in trouble or misrepresent things to other people or get you in deals that are terrible or this kind of stuff are pretty high. Yeah. And so Richard's life was by degrees chaotic and by degrees difficult to navigate without somebody going to jail. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this. And you are obviously w- w- with Jenny, his, his, um, his, his ex uh, or, or his widow. Yeah. Uh, in the next in the next installment, but I I want to know if he talked with you about grandmother, his grandmother, and oh, his mother. Did he talk all the time about it, or was no, it a uh, com- common thing? Or yeah, was I think we uh, talked frequently about it. His grandmother was the most important parental figure in his life. Uh, this is Peoria, Illinois. Richard is born, I think, in 1940, if I remember right, and uh, she ran a series of whorehouses right. on a street, on Washington Street, actually, in Peoria. She had three whorehouses, more or less, in a row. And Richard was raised in that environment. His mother was working as a hooker, and, and she didn't spend a lot of time with Richard. The grandmother did spend a lot of time. It was a difficult and perilous environment emotionally and, and um, I think, in a lot of other ways. The... Um, However, he loved his grandmother, and she was tough as nails. You would have to be in those days in a town as small as Peoria to run successful whorehouses. And uh, so Richard loved her, and she came to stay with Richard periodically in California. And um, I liked her, but I also recognized that uh, she, hmm, she was very proud of Richard's ability to make money. Right, you know, that's what that's what impressed her. Yeah, what was what was his life like as a boy in those places? Well, Jenny can tell you more about this, but I will just say, Richard told me at various times. He said that he had his first sexual encounter with one of the girls in the house when he was eight, oh, yeah. and she gave him a blowjob, and oh, yeah. he didn't know what that was exactly, but came back for more. Wow, and. Uh, I think it's safe to say that it was a, an emotionally perilous life. On the other hand, that environment, which included winos and hustlers and, and uh, drug dealers and a lot of variety of lunatics one way or another, that became the grist for much, much of Richard's core comedy. If you think about the winos he plays, sure, yeah. they sound real. Guess why they sound real? Because yeah. he grew up with them. He knew right. 20 of them. They were his uncles, quote, unquote. You, you know, um, I'm going to pull you back over to the movies for a second. Yeah. He makes, it, it's, it's sort of interesting. When I think of Richard Pryor, I don't actually think about movies that much. Yeah. I think of his comedy. I think of him like I think of Lenny Bruce or, you know, yeah. the way I think now of Dave Chappelle and a few other people. Um, I, I th- the, I, uh, he made big, big movies. Mm-hmm. I mean, big, you know, he had uh, the, the, the string of movies with Gene Wilder, the, the, the Stir Crazy and Silver Streak, and, you know, these, are, yeah. these would make a lot of money. But he also starts making a lot of bad movies. Especially in the last, most recent, the last years of his life, he yeah. did. He makes, you know, The Toy, and he makes Superman 3, and he makes, I don't know, there are, there are, there are a series of them, I think. Um, what do you think is happening to him at this at this moment? So, Bill, first thing you it depends on how you look at this. If you look at it from a studio point of view, if a if a movie makes money, if it's profitable, it's a good movie. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter whether it's a good movie or not. Yeah, and I assume Superman you know, three probably made money, and it made money. Yeah. So, I just made a quick list of the pictures that Richard was in that made money. Okay, and they include Bingo Long, which we talked about, Car Wash, which we talked about, Lady Sings the Blues, of Which Way Is Up. Bustin' Loose, Silver Streak, Stir Crazy, Uptown Saturday Night, yeah. California Suite, yes. Superman, The Wiz, and then three huge knockout concert films. Yeah, the concert films. Oh, huge. Yeah, the, uh, huge. Yeah, huge. And a, then, absolute genius. let's look at the other side of that ledger for a second. Okay. The bad movies, meaning the ones that didn't make any money. Right. You may love these movies. I, I like two or three of them myself, but in fact, I made one, two... Two of these bad movies with Richard. 
I, it's and nice I, of you and, to own up to that. That's oh that's, yeah, that's, well, that's listen, nice. I, you're talking to the guy. <laughs> you're talking to the guy who gave Xanadu a go ahead. Okay, oh, there, there which yeah. I will. Which, by the way, someday we have to do a whole thing on Xanadu. Yeah, I can't yeah, right. wait for that. Yeah, I'm, that'll I, be so much fun yeah. for me. Yes. Anyway, I, go I ahead. Need, I need to be a lot older to do that. <laughs> so, in any event, um, those bad movies are The Toy, Holy Moses, Critical Condition, Brewster's Millions, a remake of a great Preston Sturges movie, yes. Blue Collar, Paul Schrader. Were a great yeah, but, screenplay. but that's not a bad movie, Blue a, Collar. Yeah, but it lost every dime. Yeah, yeah it's a serious movie. We're treating yeah. a serious actor yeah. with Harvey Keitel and yeah, exactly. Yafet yeah. Koto. It's, it's a terrific movie, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, see No Evil, Hear No Evil, Moving. Yeah, and the Moving. Movie, the movie, I know. Then the movie he wrote and directed himself, Jojo Dancer. Yes, which, which that, 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 that takes me right, right where I want to go, and you know where I want to go now. Mm -hmm. That Jojo Dancer was basically his way of saying, I'm going to show you my life yes. in a scripted form, Right. and it followed that night. It, right. it, a few years after that night, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. That night, and that, I guess that night is, let me see, I, I wrote it down here, June 9th, 1980. Yes. You uh, you get uh, I don't know how to start this. You get a phone call. You're you're in the uh, the studio or at home someplace, and you get a phone call on yeah. June 9th, nineteen eighty. Give me give me what happens then. When you run a movie studio, you have to protect the assets of the studio. Mm -hmm. The material assets are easy. Hire a bunch of guards, put them around the edge of the lot, Universal's lot, 420 acres is a tour, a bunch of people coming and going every year, people stealing computers and, and uh, the executives having trysts with secretaries and all kinds sure. of nonsense that you have to yeah. sort of deal with. Yeah. But also, the other thing the studio has as an asset are its stars. And so we had a bunch of stars, most of them comedy stars. And so... Security was always run at Universal. I would always hire the retiring head of the Vice Squad for Hollywood, LAPD. That guy, usually an old white guy, that guy was always uh, smart about how to manage the press with regard to the things that could really damage the brand. I got gotcha. you. And so Richard was a big brand, and he was also a troubled brand. And so my so guys. So when something, something went south, he knew who to call. Oh, he didn't even have to. Yeah. My guys were on him almost all the time. Right. Okay. If there was some. All right. You know, gotcha. And the people that really called were LAPD. Right. If somebody called the police about a Universal star, they called Larry at Universal and said, "Oh, we just got this. Before we do anything, we want to let you know." So you got, so you got a you got a star who's a, a drunk driving and he just hit a wall. And he's here ranting and raving. Um, what do you want to do about this? That's right. And he's starring in an episodic TV show that means a lot of business for the company. Right. And so you want to protect that star. And sure. Things get, uh, it gets handled, and it stays largely out of the press. Right. Or it's a, if it's in the press, it's a mitigated kind of press report. Yeah. You know, it's, it had an unfortunate accident on Mulholland, <laughs> I, you know. And, and so... Wow. I get a call from my head of security who says, nightmare at Richards. So he tells me what's going on. And I said, so are you guys in the house yet? And he said, no, we're at the gate. And I said, go in. Sweep the house. Has LAPD talked to you? He said, we've talked to them, but they're not here yet. They're on the way. Meaning he's got them a block away holding. Holding them. So my guys go through the house, and my guys find a little over 800000 in cash. In Just hanging, sitting around. Sitting around. They find a lot of drugs. They find a bunch of guns. Yeah. So those kinds of things are disappeared. They are put in a bag and carried away. I, they, somehow they disappear. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so LAPD is told, please come in. Mm -hmm. And they even, in one of the police reports, they say... The house may have been cleaned up before we got there. <laughs> Who died? Yeah, you don't exactly. know anything. Yeah. Listen, when John Belushi died, you don't think... At the same time, their LAPD, they know the drill. I completely know the drill. This yeah. is all about reciprocity. Sure. They help us, we help them. Right. And we help them, by the way, in very simple ways. Mm -hmm. The studio always had Universal, always had really good and like a couple of dozen really good Dodger tickets. Mm -hmm. so Dodger tickets went to 
police captains and lieutenants around the divisions that mattered to us and people that said, and that was the tiniest part of it. We never bribed anybody, sure. quote unquote. But, but I, I, I know this for a fact, uh, those, uh, the cops off hours worked for the studios a lot. A lot. Uh, so doing security for, for location shoots. Yes. Uh, there was big money in it. It's how they made ends meet. So there was, a, as you say, there was a reciprocity going yeah, on. Yeah, and there. everybody knew everybody. Yeah, so, right. And L.A., I've got to say, in those days, L.A. was a smaller town than it is today. Right. And there were clearer lines of power and authority. So the cops show up and they thing, and Richard's in the hospital, and he right. takes to the Grossman Burn Center, which is the best burn place on the West Coast. And, and uh, Dr. Grossman, who I know, is, and they say, we don't know if he's going to make it. We don't know if he's going to make it. The burns are so severe and they cover so much of his body, and I'm sure Jennifer will tell you much more about this. Right. But it was not a happy moment for anybody, and so I think, okay, maybe Richard's dead by the morning. Right. Who knows? Right. Get through a night. Next day. No improvement. Right. Getting ready to do massive amounts of skin grafts. They have him in a hyperbaric chamber. They're using pure oxygen. Just so people understand, uh, he, he was, he, there was a, a rum. There was the, the freebasing. Um, he had basically covered, he had a lot of rum on it. He basically he, made himself he, a he, human he, fireball. He blew up a bottle of rum on top of his self. Yes, yeah, exactly. Human fireball. His right. face was badly and, yes, exactly. injured and his upper body and his yes. three quarters of Richard was burned to a crisp. Right. So uh, I'm in the studio at uh, my office and my little desk, and it's maybe 5 o'clock in the evening. Uh, Are you finally president at this time? Yeah. Okay, fine. We, so we got just there. Flying, to, yeah, it, it's all, yeah. So the phone rings, but yeah. it's the phone that nobody uses except Mr. Wasserman and maybe five or six key people, like the head of security. Right. You know, it's a phone that I answer always because it's never... Something, there's never good news. Yeah, it's never, well, it's always of consequence. Yes, Whatever that's right. the consequence right. may be. It's, you know, it could sure. be, it could be, hey, we bought Paramount. I don't know. Yeah, sure. But, you know, so uh, there's nobody on the line, but there's a hiss. And I can hear this, tss, this sibilant sound. And then out of that hiss, I hear a voice that says, Tom, Tom. And I go, what the fuck? And I go, oh my God, it's fucking Richard. And Richard has found a live phone next to his bed in the hospital. The line is still connected, and he has called the number that he always called me on because it was Richard, he's one of my big stars. If there's a problem, yeah. I need to know it. And he said... I said, okay, Richard, I'll help you, and all that stuff. So I get off the phone. I call Jack Grossman, a doctor who runs the burn center, and said, will somebody please take the damn phone out of Richard's room because a thing yeah, and a thing. Can't and, have and, him calling said, people. and I need to go see him. He said, you can't go see him. Mm -hmm. It's too dangerous. It's a bacteria, germs. No, right. you can't. It's not, not yet. You can't. So that was a... That was a very, very uh, weird and moving event in my life. And Richard was on the cusp of death, and yet I, after that call, I believed he would come through. And he did come through. And thank God for the Grossman Burn Center. They're right. amazing doctors, and they do great work, unusually good work. Do you remember the first time you saw him in person, after that, the, the yeah, it was the, probably the months later yeah. when I finally saw him. But yeah. and he looked awful. Yeah, he looked just awful. He was skinny as a rail, and his, you know, the skin had not healed, and right. things. Where there were a lot of skin grafts going on. Those continued for months and months and months, and you know, it was a difficult uh, period. You know, I, I worked um, every day around uh, Whoopi Goldberg for yeah. mm -hmm. a decade. I love her. And we'd occasionally talk about Richard. And what I, I don't remember what she would say, but here's what I remember. 
is when I would bring up the name Richard Pryor, her mood intensified. Mm -hmm. There was, uh, I don't know if it was a sadness, a sort of like, whatever that was, it was like something lost there. Yes. That something, something that she wishes she could rewrite. And I, th I wonder, mm -hmm. I wonder, and not that she did anything wrong, I just mean something like if we could have somehow done something different. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel that way? Do you know what I'm saying about this? Yeah, Richard? I do. Richard, Richard had a very uh, deep, commanding, emotional presence. Talk to Lily about it. Yeah. She'll tell you, you know, and I'm sure Whoopi felt the same way. It's, he was not uh, an inconsequential person. Right. He was not someone you could know casually. You either didn't know him at all, like, hey, Rich, how you doing? Anybody called him Rich, I knew they were like yeah. bullshit, you know, yeah. out right. of here. Right. But... Um, if you knew him at all, for real, then he didn't go away. He was an abiding presence in your life. He was in my life until he died, and still is. And you know, Bill, people do documentaries about Richard all the time now, so I sometimes appear in those documentaries, and yes. it's so uh, odd. It's like, it's a little bit like a seance. It's just odd. When you think about Richard, and I think about who he is and what that means. I feel like he's still there somehow. Yeah. And I just sound, at the risk of sounding like a complete California la la yeah, weirdo. Yeah. That's okay. Which say, you are. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's probably yeah. earned it. But yeah. you know. You know, you. I didn't realize this until until I looked it up. That that Mark Twain prize that everybody, yep. uh, you know, I don't know. Steve Martin gets and Robin Williams, gets, I don't know, whoever it is. Yep. That the first one didn't exist okay. until you and you and I guess a, a group of people decided yep. we need to make up some, this thing for okay. humor in America. A little different than that. Larry Wilker was running the Kennedy Center. Right, okay. Larry's a good guy. He's a guy I knew from politics in Washington. He's running right. Synergy, and he had been in, around entertainment. So he was in L.A. and said, let's have lunch. We went to... La Dome, we had lunch. Uh, he said, the place needs money. And it did. Yeah. It needs money badly. And I have to do some things that generate some money. Yeah. So I need you to come up with some stuff. And I said, well, what have you got? I mean, you must have some things in development. He said, well, we've got this play and this thing and this dance thing and this stuff. And, stuff. and I said, yeah, so at the risk of sounding like a complete Philistine, I will mm. say this is a really good time for you to uh, put NPR on the shelf mm -hmm. and go for mainstream sure. American presence. If That's you can right. do that, Let's you will generate Make some contact cash. with the folks. That's right. Make contact with so the do not, do not sell your soul to the Washington Beltway, to the foggy sure. bottom crowd, because if right. you do that, you will have to rely for the rest of your life on new appropriations from Congress every three years to keep mm -hmm. the place afloat. Yeah. So he said, well, these guys, these couple of guys came with me this idea. They want to do a, a humor prize. I said, so what's that? It was humor. I mean, Larry had no way of knowing, but humor was my sweet spot for sure. decades. I was just in the middle of that all the time. He said, well... I guess we could do a show. I said, well, what's it? What do we call it? He said, I don't know. We name it after somebody. So we had this lunch discussion. Out of that discussion came the Mark Twain Prize. Right. And so these guys, the producers, who still produce it to this day, and I produced with them the first one. I executive produced it. Um, so I said, look, I'll, here's what I'll do. And Richard Pryor had had the accident, and he had now, and now it's a couple of years later, he'd also been diagnosed with MS. Mm hmm so Richard's in bad shape and he's in a wheelchair. Right. And I said, Richard Pryor is beloved in the comedy community. I can get everybody in the comedy community to show up for this. Let's do him first. And that will be meaningful to me and I'll help finance this in some way. Blah, blah, blah. So we did. And we launched it. And the most important thing about that, in a weird way, I mean, Lily showed up. That was great. She was huge. Everybody else showed up. Robin, everyone, but Whoopi got on her bus yeah. and drove across yeah, she the country. Fly. She doesn't fly. That's Whoopi, right. Whoopi 
Hard to get Whoopi someplace if it's on the other side of the country. She's she got to get on the bus. That's right. She crossed America yeah. to show up for Richard at that moment on yeah. that show. Yeah. And the show got great ratings, and it was on Comedy Central when and it was And it's launched. still around. Well, it moved over from Comedy Central to NPR, but it's still around. It's still around. That's fantastic. Look, I, I know that we have really barely scratched the surface of this, that we haven't, as you said, talked about his MS. By the way, Barbara Walters did three interviews with him. I haven't even talked about that yet. We are going to do, uh, in, in, in the next installment of this, um, an interview with Jenny Pryor, who knew him really better than anybody. Um, she was his... What, fourth and seventh wife or something, something like that? Something like that. We'll she was there at the end. I've, <laughs> I've got the numbers wrong. I'm sorry, Jenny, if that's the case. But there's so many things. Uh, um, uh, we haven't talked about the N-word, which was a big, a big part of his life and, and how that has changed over the years and so on. So that'll be next time. Thank you. This was fantastic, by the way. Thank you very much for Thank sharing you. all of this. I hope uh, I hope you're not still a little high from that hit for a few years ago. Uh, I wouldn't count on anything. You seem a little high. It, it's it's right. just, it could you. just be me. Thank you for uh, that cogent <laughs> observation, Bill. And then I just want to remind the listening audience and the viewing audience yeah. that the martini glasses you brought in this morning are <laughs> waiting for you cleaned in the outer lobby. So. Yeah, that's the, that's the truth. Uh, that's the truth. Um, anyway, uh, this has been great, and this has been Take Bound.